So singular spectrum analysis, it applies non-parametric techniques to decompose time series into uh, principal components to mine the hidden features in a time series. It is particularly valuable for long time series for which patterns are, not, are difficult to visualize and analyze. And uh, the original SSA method requires manual detection of the number of spectral groupings. And uh, we are trying to um, using the weighted correlation between components to uh, automatically grouping and uh, then uh, realize the automatic process of SSA analysis. So here is the data we use to showcase how we realize the SSA. Um, here is a 129 years of monthly temperature data. So the series is very long, and by just visual um, looking at the data, you can't see any obvious patterns. And here is another plot of the same data. So it plots the January to December, month by month, for every year of the temperature data. So the original series has been deseasonalized. On this plot, you couldn't identify any apparent seasonal patterns. So we are applying singular spectrum analysis to this data to find if there is any hidden feature. So there are some um, steps for the SSA method. I'm not going through the, uh, going into the detail math for the method. So the basic step is the embedding step, which uh, create a trajectory of trajectory matrix of the original time series. And in the decomposition step, we apply singular value decomposition to the trajectory matrix and uh, come out with some singular values. And uh, in the grouping step, basically, um, we are trying to reduce dimension and uh, group similar singular values in the same groups. And then in the averaging step, we are just averaging the singular values for the same group to create those um, representative patterns for each group. And finally, if you want to do forecasting, of course, you can do apply different forecast techniques for each individual groups. So um, one the important step in SSA is to how to find find the groups. So here is a plot of the singular values that we identified during the decomposition step. And uh, to group them, of course, you want to group the similar singular values into one group. Of course, the first the first singular value is, the first component is really distinct from others. So that's the first group, that forms the first group. And the second component is also different from others, so that's the second group. And three and four, you can see the levels are really close to each other. So that forms our third group. Five, six, seven, again, they are really close to each other. So that's our fourth group. And we just want to stop here, and the rest you can see it's slowly decaying. The singular values are slowly decaying, and we want to consider the rest are just noise, and we, we want to stop here. Okay. Um, here is a before and after plot of uh, what we have here. Before is the original series, and after is the four components, four groups we identified it using singular spectrum analysis. So uh, you can see the first group is the, it shows the upward trending in the original series. And then the second group uh, is not showing clearly here, but you can see more details in the paper. The second group um, spectral analysis shows that there is a 22 years of cycle in the second series. That corresponds to the hail solar effect. And then the third group is just the green line. That's corresponding to the yearly cycle in the temperature data. And the fourth group, spectral density analysis again shows there is a, a five year cycle which corresponds to the El Nino cycle. And uh, so although we couldn't identify much pattern from the original series, but SSA was used to, um, is able to discover 
potential patterns, and we are able to identify four distinct patterns in this series. So it is like my information in from this temperature data. But uh, the previous results are gen generated from manually analyzed uh, spectral values. If you have a lot of data to analyze, that will be very inefficient to just go through each single time series. So we come out with a way to automate the grouping process. Uh, we are checking the weighted correlations among each singular values. And uh, here is a heat map of the weighted correlations. To show it more clearly, so basically um, the red ones are highly correlated ones and blue ones are relatively uh, have lower correlations among each uh, singular values. So for the automated process, we just need to specify a threshold for the weighted correlations. Only, um, only the components with correlations higher than the threshold we specify, those will go into one group. For the ones that have lower correlations, they will be in different groups or even not considered. And uh, here is a zoom in of the heat map. So in this example, we set the threshold to 0.8. So only the correlations that is higher than 0.8 will be selected into the same group. So from this gra graph, you can see, again, one is by itself, component two is by itself, and three and four is that uh, left big square in the left corner. That's in the third group and five and six is in the fourth group. So comparing to the manual choice, now component seven is left out because if you look at the group graph, the correlation between seven and five and six are actually lower than 0.8. So that's the reason it's not selected by the automated grouping process. But again, the results between the automated grouping and the manual grouping is very similar. We can also, um, get that information by comparing the results, uh, the results series side by side. So it's nearly identical. So to, con to conclude what we have, a uh, singular spectrum analysis is a very powerful tool for detecting patterns in long time series with very few model assumptions. And it can effectively effectively decompose time series into spectral groupings. And uh, with introduction of this uh, weighted correlation set up a threshold for the correlations, we are able to automate it, find the groupings for singular spectrum analysis. So in the end, these spectral groupings can, can be individually analyzed using time series techniques. So for the previous data, we end up with four groupings. You can apply, you can analyze them independently and apply forecasting techniques or any models you want to use. And then at the end, add them up, you can get a forecasting results for the original series. So that's it, and here are some reference for the techniques we use. Thank you. So uh, uh, thanks the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present the work that uh, I did with SAS during my internship there. And I'm currently a grad student in North Carolina State University. So today I'm gonna talk about uh, short-term wind energy forecasting with temporal dependent neural network uh, methods. And um, so the problem is that in wind energy forecasting, a lot of times people generally fall into two groups, either using temporal uh, time series methods with AREMA and exogenous time series like other covariates or using uh, regression based methods like neural network or other uh, machine learning methods. Uh, but then this is a kind of a graph showing the data we use and probably representing a lot of other data uh, you regularly see in wind short term wind forecasting is that uh, wind speed is a strong predictor in wind forecasting problems but then uh, when you're giving a wind speed, because there are a lot, lot of other potential confounding factors you are not actually measuring, and giving a wind speed, you can actually still having a wide range of energy output. Uh, so, and part of it is, for example, having um, 
uh, air density, temperature, and the humidity, all those things can affect, and you are not measuring those, and causing you have temporal dependencies on your output energy. And that's why we we're trying to incorporate in time series and machine learning methods to solve that problems. So previously, a lot of uh, times people would use uh, ARIMA or ARIMA-X, which is uh, time series focused methods, or using any of those following uh, machine learning methods, but based on a regression-based idea and assuming uh, uh, temporally independent independence. So for us, for example, if we just assuming temporal independence and feed a feed-forward neural network, and we can see that the residual autocorrelation, partial autocorrelation, that there are still temporal dependencies there, even if you, even, and this is actually, we engineered some of the uh, time-related covariates, and still we wouldn't be able to remove that. So what we decided to do is we either uh, add those uh, lag variables as AR models into the feed-forward neural network, which is a kind of autoregressive neural network, or we feed the previous uh, uh, history sequences as part of the sequences in uh, recurrent neural network and then use that, concatenate that with other covariates you may have and use that for forecasting. Um, and the key is that in the previous slide here, you can see that uh, in the partial autocorrelation function, you see two lags in this function. And actually that's very indicative how many lags you should add in the other two models I mentioned when you either use autoregressive neural network or recurrent neural network. Uh, because when you use enough lags, here it's doing lag one case or lag two case, you are sufficiently to remove the partial autocorrelation in your, uh, in your residual analysis, and that applies the same for the recurrent neural network case. And actually, this also goes along with your uh, forecasting accuracy. So when you have the right number of lags, then you basically achieve the uh, forecasting accuracy, and, and you basically have the independence of your residuals. And, that, and when you had more lags, then it pretty much reached the plateau, but when you have less than you, because of the uh, autocorrelation in your residuals, you actually don't have that good enough performance. And the reason we want to have this method to tune the right number of uh, autocorrelation to include in your model or the length of the sequence in your recurrent neural network is that if you have more, uh, the right panel here showing that it's multi-step ahead forecasting, which we forecast 24 hours ahead and giving out 24 values in the future. And because you're using, uh, in most of the methods, you need the most adjacent values for multi-step ahead forecasts. And if you don't have them, you typically can uh, put in predicted value in there, and that can cause accumulation of error in multi-step ahead forecast. Uh, so in this case, if you have long, more than enough sequence in there in your history, you actually include a lot of errors in the multi-step ahead forecast steps. So that's why here showing that uh, in the autoregressive neural network or RN and using one step recursive forecast to do the multi-step ahead forecast, you actually increase your uh, error as, long, uh, as your history length goes longer. Um, and the other method we actually include is using a sequence to sequence translation method from the RN, and that actually is relatively ro robust and regardless of how long his historical sequence you include there. So, um, and also this is a kind of a, a numerical summarization of one step ahead and multi-step ahead forecast and both methods that take into consideration of temporal dependency and also covariates actually have the uh, better performance. So the conclusion is that um, take consideration of the temporal dependency in those neural network models is uh, essential for the, um, for the wind energy forecasting problem and also the analysis of autocorrelation, uh, partial autocorrelation in the initial residuals are actually indicative of how long sequence you need to uh, incorporate in those models. And that will be it. Thank you. I will present our work about time series classification for scrap rate prediction. Okay. Uh, so our goal was to design a data-driven 
scrap rate prediction system for a manufacturing process, which is called transfer molding, uh, which is able to give warnings if the scrap rate will increase in the next production period. Uh, thinking about uh, classification problems in manufacturing, it would be trivial to classify the individual product based on the label scrap or good, uh, but for this problem it would make no sense because the products are immediately inspected uh, after the production. A short technical overview about the problem. So the product on which we focused is an inverter for electric cars. Uh, which is produced by Bosch uh, in Hungary and in Germany. Uh, it is packaged with a process which is called transfer molding. Uh, you can see the steps of this uh, process here. So epoxy pellets are fed into the molding tool and then they are melted and pressed into the cavity under high pressure. And after that, the epoxy is cured in va vacuum. Uh, the dominant failure mode of this process is called delamination and means uh, air entrapments between the heat sink and the epoxy compound. Uh, for the prediction task, the much imp most important data which we used uh, were the transfer graphs, which are uh, three time series recorded for each uh, indiv individual uh, part. You can see them there, so they are the pressure, the position of the plunger and the vacuum. Uh, this is how we define the scrap rate prediction as a classification problem. Uh, for that, you have to know that the production is organized hierarchically, which means that uh, the products are made in charts, also called batches, which contains something about 300 products. Um, one charge is uh, products for, uh, which were produced following each other without changing anything in the production or stopping the machine. Um, after producing four or five charts, uh, the machine is cleaned and the production stops for a while. So that makes sense to predict the scrap rate for that cleaning phase. So as you can see on this figure, our goal is to, to be able to give a warning after the third, first charge produced. And this warning should mean that the scrap rate will increase uh, until the next cleaning. Uh, we mean this increase in a relative way, which means that we use the, this formula for, for generating a label for the classification. And the data which we used for the classification uh, is generated from the transfer graphs of this first charge after cleaning. The test setup for our experiment was like that. Uh, we took each cleaning phase as test set and we used the cleaning phases of the past as a training set for it. And as I mentioned, uh, transfer graphs are recorded for each individual product, but we needed to generate features for the charges, which are containing 300 products. And for that, uh, we generated these features on two ways. Uh, the first and uh, less difficult one was uh, just generating features from the transfer graphs for, uh, for the individual products and then take some statistics of them like mean, minimum, maximum and like that. And the other one was to defining a certain charge similarity, which means that we took the so-called filling pressures, which are the first 50 points of the pressure transfer graphs, and we ordered them in a series of time series and we generated 50 time series by taking the first measurements points and so on. And after that, we calculated pairwise uh, dynamic time warping distances for them and we took the sum of squares and used them as features. And here you can see the res results of the classification. Uh, so 
on the charge similar similarity data set, uh, nearest neighbor and support vector machine methods were working good. On the transfer graph statistics, uh, we used support vector regression. And the top two uh, predictions could also combine well. On the other figure, you can see the prediction scores of the best prediction. Uh, the x axis means the uh, so the different uh, cleaning phases, and on the y axis you can see the prediction score. And the red points are where the warning should be given. Summary: uh, At the end, uh, we define the scripted prediction system as a classification task, and our method is data driven, which means that we used uh, for the testing three months of uh, sensor and process measurements. And at the end, the model is able to give unexpected warnings to the operators because it, these uh, warnings are not foreseeable from the scrap rate trends, for example. It's also type sensitive because we always retrain the classifier after each prediction. Uh, one of the main uh, things was that uh, the higher hierarchical ma manufacturing data had to be ordered into multiple time series for generating features. And at the end, uh, we used support vector regression and two nearest neighbor on the generated data sets. Thank you for your attention.